This video was brought to you by Blinkist. When's the last time you opened a wedding invitation and thought, ooh, can't wait to spend my whole paycheck on monogrammed hand towels for Gabrielle and Troy, who will definitely stay together forever? Yeah, I thought so. You don't have to troll a certain subreddit to know that weddings can cause Oppenheimer test bomb level ethical and financial drama amongst normally peaceful families and friends. This isn't surprising. The average wedding in 2022 cost about $30,000. And even just showing up to party can set you back an average of $611 per wedding. If you need me, I'll be at the bar across the street. And for all of this, weddings rank number seven out of the 43 most stressful life events. So why are we all going broke for the chance to do the cha-cha slide with our friend's drunk uncle? What are these cakes, bouquets, and truly horrifying living champagne walls doing for us? And what's actually happening when this hits my feed? Yeah, so much for the perfect algorithm. Anyway, let's find out in this video, are weddings a scam? But before we get into it, I wanna talk about this video's sponsor, Blinkist. If you're anything like me, you love reading and learning new things, but every day is so busy and exhausting, you feel like you hardly have the time or energy to pick up a book anymore. If that sounds like you, Blinkist is here to help. Blinkist is an app that allows you to get the most important information from a library of over 6,500 titles that you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. That means when you're driving to work, waiting for the bus, or, I don't know, getting ready to film a Wisecrack video, you can brush up on your philosophy, learn about the future of science, or finally understand what the heck was going on in that great American novel that you totally, definitely read in high school English class. Today I'm listening to Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, which, among so many other ideas, discusses how and why the institution of marriage has been a little bit problematic for women, at least in the past. If you liked today's video, I really recommend checking out this blink for more context on the topic. You can get all the information you need without the, um, commitment of diving into a whole new novel. Another feature the Blinkist app offers is Blinkist Spaces. This feature allows you to create a space with friends or family where you can recommend titles to each other. All the members of a shared space can access all the titles in the space, with or without a Blinkist premium subscription. Which is so exciting for me because I've been trying to start a book club with my friends for ages. If any of this sounds like something you'd be interested in, try out Blinkist for yourself. When you click the link in the description, you'll get a seven day free trial along with 25% off Blinkist annual premium subscription. Again, visit Blinkist.com slash Wisecrack to get a seven day free trial and 25% off your annual premium subscription. And now, back to the show. So where does the classic contemporary American wedding even come from? Well, for most of history, marriage was mostly a handshake deal for dividing labor and forging peace between small clans. Once power structures like the Roman state and Christian church got involved, they only cared about marriage amongst royalty and wealthy people, because the institution was about, one, transferring guardianship of the bride from father to husband, ew, two, protecting wealth and property, three, ensuring legitimate heirs, and four, forging political alliances. Elaborate wedding traditions were only enjoyed by the upper echelon. In some parts of medieval Europe, lower class folks weren't even allowed to marry. Marriage for non-elites was rooted in practicalities, like increased economic stability and dividing work. Their weddings were modest, often taking place in the bride's home, and folks often wore everyday clothing. Guests contributed food, along with goods and money, to help the new couple throw their party and set up their home. And parties were often a rowdy good time, lasting as long as the beer did. A transformative time for the Western wedding came in the 1800s. The previous two centuries saw developments like individualism and humanism, which helped reconceive marriage as rooted in romantic love. Marrying someone you actually thought was hot would transform the institution. The sea change was clear in 1840, when Britain's Queen Victoria married hunkalunk Prince Albert. The smitten kitten reinvented the modern wedding with a romantic blowout, establishing future trends like the obnoxiously large wedding cake, the ornate long wedding gown, and the diamond engagement ring. Hers was shaped like a serpent cause Vicky went hard. With the stage set, the future of weddings would map almost perfectly onto the development of the consumer economies in Britain and America. As Victoria's trend-setting wares became increasingly accessible to the masses. It's important to note here that many wedding traditions don't mean what they used to. For Victorian brides, the engagement period was about sewing new linens and making and gathering items for their future homes. At her wedding, the bride was queen for the day, largely as a reward for staying a virgin. Was it worth it though? The ceremony also symbolized the couple passing from adolescence into adulthood. And the honeymoon that followed typically just involved the couple hanging out and drinking honeybee to loosen up while they learned to be compatible. I want to please my wife here on our honeymoon, 
but I don't know what I'm doing. But as the years went on, the symbolism faded. For many, marriage wasn't the same passage into adulthood because more young people had already left their parents' house behind to move into cities. Cheap, mass-produced goods meant brides could buy or be gifted most things they needed for their future homes. And many, many girlies were no longer virgins. So all of these rituals needed a new foundation. And the nascent consumer economy was there to fill the void via a different kind of marriage. That between romance and consumerism. We've talked a lot about consumer culture lately, so we'll just take a couple of pit stops here. The first wave of 1920s consumer wedding culture was about the invention of tradition via department stores, jewelers, florists, and so on. This created elaborate expectations for weddings that would be disseminated by the huge bridal magazine industry. Nobody was more successful at inventing tradition than one diamond bag, Ernest Oppenheimer of De Beers. Different Oppenheimer, in case you're wondering. The dude won his empire with tactics like literal mercenary wars, then spun the diamond ring into the the holiest of traditions via sexy taglines. And to this day, you're still spending two months' salary on a rock. Anyway, weddings were becoming a way to claim class status. Still, Victoria-inspired events were a luxury, and the rural and working class continued to enjoy humble, communal, homespun weddings, with receptions often taking place in church basements catered by the bride's mom. But after World War II, the wedding emerged as a democratic right rather than a mere luxury. Consumption was laden with meaning. As scholar Karen M. Dunnock puts it, wedding culture embodied a return to traditional morality and social stability. The elaborate white wedding was marketed as an essential tradition, even though that tradition was pretty new. Now it was accessible to an enormous middle class, who saw it as a reward for surviving the war. And by the end of the 1950s, a wedding cost the average bride's family two-thirds of their annual income. In other words, the pitch was working. By the 1960s, the standardized white wedding had become a crucial way of expressing wealth and social status. Weddings further ballooned in size and scope in the 80s, quadrupling in cost between 1984 and 1994. Folks were inspired by the luxury and showiness of the time, as well as yet another royal wedding. Brides dominated pop culture in the 90s and 2000s, and the average cost of weddings was up another 18% by 2006. Today, wedding fever continues unabated. The cost of a wedding soared from $19,000 in 2007 to 34.5,000 in 2017, adjusted for inflation. Fittingly, royalty metaphors still abound in today's wedding market, offering a sense of spiritual transcendence for every princess bride. According to sociologist Chris Ingram, decades of effective marketing turned the wedding industry into a very powerful meaning-making apparatus guaranteeing our compliance and consent to participate. That is to say, the industry convinces us that the symbol symbolic value of a glamorous wedding is so intrinsically tied to romance that reasonable adults will go broke over a cake that tastes like chalk. The wedding is conceived of as a sort of utopian event that transcends normal life, especially for the couple at the center, who enjoy a surreal day of heavily photographed glamour usually exclusive to guests at the Met Gala. But Ingram argues that this romanticized image belies reality. The modern wedding is actually a mass-marketed, homogenous, assembly line production with little resemblance to the utopian vision many participants hold. She notes that the focus is on the alienating spectacle of accumulation being created. In other words, the value the value of the marriage is judged by the luxury and opulence of the wedding. Romance and consumption go hand in hand. Romance justifies consumption, and consumption affirms the intensity of that romance. Social media has only raised the stakes by making the whole world the audience, while supplying aspirational imagery for everyone else to emulate via spending. And boy, are people spending so much money. From an average of $400 flower bouquets, to $2,000 bridal dresses, to $11,000 reception venues, to $4,000 live bands, to a $100,000 cloud bursting service to ensure there won't be That's not to mention the hours of unpaid labor that go into planning. And in heterosexual couples, the vast majority of that labor falls on the bride. Though, if you're a dude who plans your wedding, shout yourself out in the comments and restore my faith in humanity. Society still sees weddings as women's work, because as explicitly romantic events, they exist in the domain of feelings, and thus are classified as feminine. As Ingram explains, the work of feeling and caring is central to the invisible labor of women. Weddings encapsulate this expectation, and women are trained for this their whole lives, from the time their baby's mainlining Disney. It's re-articulated by magazines, movies, television, social media, and so on. Sociologist Howard Becker calls these consciousness industries that shape our values and self-conception. Representations of brides are also overwhelmingly white, young, and thin, 
thus inscribing racism and other prejudices into the equation of who counts as the perfect bride. We're certainly not saying that women who want to look hot on their wedding days are being duped, but we are saying that there's a lot of vested economic interest in getting us all to buy into the mythos. For much of modern marital history, brides have had to do, wear, eat, and say what's expected of them by their parents and communities. Since the 90s, though, there's been an increased sense of choice and personal expression via wedding planning. Writer Natasha Walter calls this a new traditionalism, where ideal womanhood is equated with being the perfect bride. That idea is infused with rhetoric of self-empowerment, as women are assured perfection can be achieved with the right products and planning. This is typical of what scholars call post-feminism, i.e. the consensus building since the 90s that feminism is no longer necessary because women now have an abundance of choices about how to live their lives. As scholars Jilly Boyce K, Helen Wood, and Melanie Kennedy write, the thinking goes, you can choose how to design your wedding. Feminism is about choice, therefore, weddings are feminist. But the insane expectations put on brides suggest that a lot of this freedom is somewhat illusory. For example, brides are expected to follow intense beauty regimens. You're not only planning the perfect occasion, you're planning the perfect self. It's become prosaic for brides to go on crash diets or intense workout sprees, while shows like Bridal Plasty imply that it's super normal to get plastic surgery before you say I do. Vogue recommends a 12-month skincare regimen for brides including injectables and laser treatments, as if all the other money that you were spending wasn't enough already. In the vein of post-feminism, women are choosing to do this, so it must be empowering. But when does it go from choice to expectation? The massive investment of time, money, blood, sweat, so much sweat, and tears into weddings somehow remains symbolically feminist while the consumption involved is synonymous with romance. Of course, that consumption is way more of a burden than it would have been for the average couple in, say, the 1920s. In a way, this wretched excess has arguably returned us to the truism of yore. Idealized weddings are once again prohibitively expensive for most people. The difference is, in the past, folks were willing to forego most unreasonable wedding expenses, whether it was peasants wearing their everyday clothes or couples charging their buddies for wedding ale. But we remain intensely attached to the symbolism of the perfectly unattainable wedding, a fact best illustrated by the fact that nearly half of American couples go into debt to get married, because nothing says romance like sky-high interest rates. So what are we really paying for? What does the lavish wedding do for us as a society? We think, and a lot of scholars agree, that they help us cope with a number of very real precarities. For scholar Angela McRoby, it's no coincidence that the elaborate wedding grew as women became more financially independent. She writes that the paraphernalia of marriage culture assumes such visibility at the very moment that its necessity is being put into question. Women's social progress is almost always met with backlash. Arguably, the sanctifying of the wedding as the all-important event of one's lifetime is a way of reinscribing old norms and expectations under a shiny gauze of post-feminism. What's more, political theorist Wendy Brown argues that, as other forms of social meaning have thinned, marriage is increasingly expected to hold every flower in the bouquet of personal happiness and fulfillment. Great sex, great children, great freedom, great adventure, along with love, excitement, fidelity, stability, and harmony. It makes sense, then, that weddings would become a site of such importance. The perfect wedding becomes symbolic of the perfect marriage that will fulfill every single need and longing you've ever had, because that's realistic. In the absence of communal bonds that, historically, imbued weddings with deep meaning, consuming our way to perfection fills the void. Kay and Co. note that, especially since the 2008 recession, the increased precarity of the middle class has made the consumption associated with weddings feel ever more important in conveying what remains of class status. They write, because the real world, increasingly characterized by inequality, precarity, social fractioning, and racism, is so full of loss, hurt, pain, and disappointment, so many of our brittle, anxious hopes seem to ride upon the wedding spectacle. And yet, there's a contradiction. As the ridiculously expensive wedding remains crucial to proving class success, marriage becomes inaccessible to many. It's no wonder that wealthy people are significantly more likely to marry. 56% of wealthy adults are married, compared to 39% of working class and 26% of poor adults. The problem with this is that the nuclear family is still treated as fundamental to social order, which means our government and society continues to incentivize marriage in myriad ways. Financial perks of marriage range from tax deductions and credits, to social security benefits, to veterans benefits, to retirement benefits, to lower premiums on health, auto, and other insurance. Not being able to afford a flashy wedding makes some folks delay marriage, and thus forfeit these rights, benefits, and breaks. So not only are wealthy people more likely to get married, but getting married will necessarily make them more wealthy. 
This seriously adds up over time. According to The Atlantic, over a lifetime, unmarried folks pay $1.3 million more on things like healthcare, taxes, and so on. That's not to mention that they'll lack other non-monetary benefits too, ranging from hospital visitation rights to after-death decisions to wrongful death lawsuits. This is where it's worth mentioning same-sex marriage, an important right that was won in part based on the valid argument that queer people deserve access to these marital benefits. Now, of course, adults should be able to marry who they love. But this argument about gay marriage still raises the question, why do we sanctify the rights of married couples over all other relationships in so many ways, especially when so many of these bonds end in divorce? For Kay Wooden Kennedy, the obsession around marriage is part of our modern myth of romantic love as the primary route to happiness. They quote academic and activist Lynn Siegel, who argues that we need to equally value all of our other relationships, familial, friendly, comradely, and many more, which contain their own pressures, rhythms, and demands, all woven around our need for each other. For most of human history and across most cultures, marriage was more about function than romance. While this often meant having a smelly spouse who sucked, it also meant they weren't necessarily the most important person in your life. We're not suggesting we go back to picking your spouse based on how many cows they own, but we think it's worth considering what a society that didn't prize marriage above all other human bonds might look like. Or one where your wedding day isn't perpetuated as the most spiritually and socially significant, and thereby most expensive, day of your life. And not just because we'd all save 600 bucks a year. But what do you guys think? Is the modern wedding a bonkers money suck that's making us all crazy and broke? Why do we structure society around the bonds of holy matrimony? And is there another way? Let us know what you think in the comments. Huge thanks to our patrons for all your support, and if you're interested in watching our videos early and without ads, consider joining our Patreon. It really helps support the channel and keeps us doing what we're doing. And thanks to all of you for watching, liking, and subscribing to our channel. We really appreciate you. Later!